An issue we haven't talked a lot about on the podcast is food and farming. And I wish we would have been talking about it more sooner because think about how many stories farming has been at the center of. I mean, our supply chain issues, you know, running out of food on the shelves, the cost of eggs, I mean, all these things. There was this um, interesting, and by interesting, I mean soul-sucking, debate in Olympia over a Senate bill, 5476. And essentially what the Senate bill, and it was proposed by a Republican, would do is it would make it so that um, for 12 weeks a year for farms in Washington state, they can have workers work up to 50 hours before overtime kicks in as opposed to 40 hours and that overtime kicks in. And so basically what they're saying is they've got these 12 uh, weeks a year where they've got the harvest going on. They need um, people to be there to work at extra, but they simply do not have the money to afford that extra overtime. And what they're saying is, and what farm workers are saying is, some farms have resorted to just bringing in more workers that they, and then spreading the work out so then they don't have to pay overtime to anyone. And so some farm workers are saying, hey, I'd rather have the 50 hours all to myself and not get overtime than have the extra hours given to someone else. So anyway, um, and here's uh, Senator Curtis King, who is the bill's sponsor, explaining kind of the necessity of this. When you think about farming, farmers don't control the weather. Farmers don't control the prices that they get for the products that they produce. Uh, we need to do something. We can't, con- they don't control. You think about a product on a tree and all of a sudden the weather gets warm and, and that fruit starts to ripen. They have, a, they have a short period of time to get that fruit off of those trees to salvage their season that they've worked on all year long. Uh, so that's what this bill addresses, is allowing a, 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 uh, a farmer to, to have seasonality 12 weeks uh, at 50 hours before overtime kicks in. If you look at all of the other states that have uh, implemented uh, ag overtime, I believe all are very close to all of them have a seasonality issue. What we're asking for here is at the low end of what you see in all of these other states. Uh, I think it's a fair and equitable thing to do, not only for the farmer, but also for the worker as well. So that's when at this hearing, two very interesting things happened. And again, by interesting, I mean soul sucking. And they demonstrate how the left brings everything back to race. Senator Karen Kaiser, she had a couple remarks during the hearing, basically saying that, you know, our current, you know, labor laws, our farming labor laws are akin to like forced labor of slaves and and black people, um, I mean, generations ago in this country. In the 1930s, when the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed by Congress, the Southern senators insisted that in order to get that bill done, they had to have an exemption for farm workers. Of course, those were mostly African-American farm workers in the South. But that exemption continued on for 60 years, and we are trying to address that inequity in this state, and I think we are making real progress, and I want to congratulate all of us for the progress we are making. So that in and of itself is just ridiculous. I mean, to to compare Washington State, like in any way, to the Deep South and our, our farming laws is is insane, right? And again, it's just about like, oh, white, it's like this white savior complex, like, oh, I'm going to save these Hispanic farm workers from the white man bad as this like white senator. It's just, it's bizarre. But then there was also, so there was some testimony given by farm workers in favor of this bill. Um, They showed up in person for testimony. There was also some remote testimony and some of them testified in Spanish. And Senator Rebecca Saldana, who's a Democrat on this particular committee, um, she, uh, Labor and Commerce, she, I don't know if she took it upon herself or what, but she translated some of that testimony. And in particular, there was this uh, translation that not only was it, did it exclude the fact that this farm worker had said he supported this, this Republican bill, but she also added her own comments onto the end of her translation in a way that was completely inappropriate. Listen. Yeah. Gracias por su testimonio. And again, just briefly saying that during the winter, it's really hard. Um, there's not enough work. There's, it's really hard to put the hours together. And so that's why when there is work, 
they need the extra hours. Being able to work 50 hours is what allows them to even survive. Um, and it would be even more if they could work those extra 10 hours and have that be time and a half with overtime. And that's my last, my, my comments, because it's really hard for me to translate when I know that they're not given all the information. Thank you. So basically, you're, you're too dumb to understand what this bill does. And, and totally butchering the translation, uh, denigrating the, the person who um, offered the testimony, the farm worker who offered the testimony, like, oh, you know, it'd be really nice if you got paid those extra 10 hours. That's not what he said. He was saying he wanted 50 hours a week, and you should have just translated. If you're going to translate, you should have just translated what he said. So anyway, her comments sent the farm world into an absolute furious frenzy in Washington state. And I asked Dylan Honkoop, uh, he uh, grew up on a farm. He hosts the Real Food, Real People podcast. I asked him to come in and just talk about what's going on with farmers in our state and with this um, urgent need for more labor during periods of the year and also to respond to what those two Democratic senators said. Dylan, welcome to Undivided. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell people a little bit about your podcast. So the Real Food, Real People podcast is all about sharing, as we say, the stories of the people behind our food. And a lot of those people are farmers, of course. But there are other people in our food system, too. The people processing the food, the people butchering, you know, chefs, uh, cooking food. It's getting their human stories, though, reconnecting people with the humanity that goes into their food. I think there's this perception that... Farming and food has become a product of a machine. And the food system is a big, evil, scary machine that you can't trust. And the reality, at least here in Washington State, is that's not true. There are still so many people and farms, you know, 95% of farms in the state are family owned and operated. So for people to be able to see that and not just you know, learn, we, we like to cover little bits about, you know, how you milk a cow or how you <laughs> harvest onions or whatever it might be. But beyond that information, get that real story of that person. They've been through a lot, just like anybody has. And then people can be like, hey, this person that's growing my food, like, they're like me. And they really care about what they're doing. It's a game changer as far as people understanding their food system and trusting the food that's grown here. Yeah, and I really love, I was telling you this before we started, that you go to where they are. You know, sometimes you'll be at their farm, at yep. a barn, outside. It's the Real Food, Real People podcast, and how can people watch it? Just uh, search that on your preferred uh, platform uh, if you want to listen on all the usual audio platforms and then on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and suppose I should be on others too. <laughs> they always tell me, you know. That's how I feel. TikTok. I'm like, I'm too old. I, I have no right? energy for TikTok. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so why is this something that you are interested in? We'll talk about your background. Well, I, I grew up as a farm kid uh, here in Western Washington, grew up on a small red raspberry farm. Um, both sets of my grandparents were in small dairy farms. Um, so that was my life. Um, after, you know, having a career in broadcast for several years, I had this opportunity to come back to the farming community with my communication stuff and be able to share those stories. That's what I was doing as a news person was sharing people's stories. So this opportunity was incredible for me to come back to my community, the people I grew up with. I know how their general vibe works, how their farms kind of work. I like to learn a lot more about them. Um, but it just fit me so perfectly to then be able to, to step in and share those stories with people who don't have access to that anymore. I mean, 50 years ago, people could get on a farm probably a lot more easily than now for a variety of reasons, but a lot of people just had relatives in it. Now, what is it? Less than 2% of the population grows our food. Very few people have that connection to someone actually doing it anymore. And I love, I love that you've taken that background and uh, radio and uh, translated it into this because my favorite kinds of podcasts are the really specific like mission driven podcasts. And so it's really interesting. And just watching a few clips, even if you're not into farming or a farmer, like you said, to kind of learn more about just the people in your communities who grow your food. So it's really, really a cool uh, project and a cool show. Um, so how much time, if any, do you spend, because we met at the Washington State Farm Bureau Convention, yep. Uh, yep. where I was speaking this year. How much time do you spend advocating um, for farmers in Washington State? Or do, do you spend any time in Olympia? 
I don't do lobbying per se. So I go to Olympia occasionally, but I try to stay away from that town. Honestly, sorry, Olympia folks, but. It's not really my jam. Um, I prefer to be out on the farm, you know, and and really with the kind of stuff that I do, I could be anywhere in Washington state. So I travel all over the state to meet these farmers, interview people, find out what's going on on the ground. And then, yeah, my, my advocacy is public outreach, letting people know the truth about what's happening with farming and our food system here in Washington state. Sadly, often the story isn't a good one about what's, what the truth is about what's happening and the misunderstandings that are leading to some serious problems. And, you know, in the last couple of years, this has become so much more important for people. For the first time in our lifetime, we've seen empty shelves, yeah. you know, during the pandemic. And that was a wake-up call for a lot of people like, oh, crap. Maybe I do need to care about where my food really comes from beyond just the like bougie trends of, well, I need to make sure I get this or don't have that. Where your food, the staples, the stuff that nourishes your body and keeps you alive comes from is an important thing to us. And, and we're still talking about food security, you know, Ukraine and a lot of other factors that are happening now. People are like, I want to know, like eggs, right? The like, why are, why are they so expensive? You talked about bougie food trends. I wish I had gotten into the bougie food trend of getting your own chicken in your backyard. Because I'd be making money hand over fist right now, selling eggs to all the neighbors. <laughs> right. um, you talked about, you know, some misunderstandings. And, and I want to get to, you know, kind of the, the crux of why we asked you in to talk about something that we said at a hearing in Olympia. But first, can you talk about... Um, 5476 was a bill that was introduced. My understanding of it is to really help make sure that these farmers have enough people and enough uh, work to get their harvest done so you don't have food that just sits on the vine or whatever it is. Can you talk a little bit about the genesis of its Senate bill, 5476? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, the whole idea is about farm workers, right, and ma making sure that the people who are harvesting our food, you know, but Food is one of these, and farming is one of these areas where it still requires a lot of hands-on, old school, get dirty and, and get, you know, the food harvested kind of labor. And, you know, people are still working on robots and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of that stuff that will always be, and I'm really, I want it, I would rather my food be picked by humans than robots. But the reality is, it's about taking care of those workers, and that's where this idea of overtime came to the fore a couple of years ago. There was a court case and then some ensuing legislation that rolled out overtime pay, time and a half pay, over a threshold uh, for farm workers, ostensibly to help them make more money. The reality is they're making less money as a result of that because of the dynamics of that, and we can get into why that is. Yeah. But for farm workers, first and foremost, because, again, that's what this whole overtime issue is about, is making sure they're well taken care of. They're clamoring for a change. They're saying, this doesn't work for me. This is hurting my family. It's making it hard for me to get by. I've gone backwards. We heard that from multiple people testifying on this bill. Let me work. Let us work is the refrain I've been hearing in the two years since this became law and they're rolling it out. Everywhere I go, workers are like, we don't want this. This is going to hurt us now. It is hurting them. So this bill would allow during a harvest season, and that's the other thing about farming that we have to get into here, that this is different than a factory job. This is different than working in an office. You have a really busy, busy time of the year it's, and yeah, a little less. It's seasonal and super busy at one time of the year. And the other side of the year, almost nothing to do, really, in, in depending on the farm and, you know, what you're doing. So this bill would allow people to get more hours during those busy seasons. That's the idea very simply. Um, it would allow a 12-week window to be decided by a farm where that threshold of where time and a half pay starts would go up to 50 hours rather, rather than 40 hours. Sounds very simple. But to some people, that's a, a, an affront to this idea of overtime, which I understand that, again, if, you're, if you work in a factory, if you work in an office, that's a different equation entirely. And so to them, it's, it's ripping people off. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the bill as it, the law as it exists right now yeah. is like it would be kind of for all of us, right, at 40 hours a week. 
Anything after that, you're getting time and a half. And it's actually phasing in. So last year in 22, it was 55 was the threshold. This year, 23, the threshold is 48 hours. Next year, it will be 40. And that's where it will stay according to that 2021 decision by the state legislature. And so is the argument from the farm community that if we have to start during this busy period paying time and a half at 40 hours, we can't afford it? Absolutely. I mean, and particularly for the smaller farms, their choice is right now, either they, then this is why people aren't able to make as much money. There's not enough money to pay that much more for those additional hours. So their choice is to bring on more people, take that pie that they have of, you know, dollars for hours Mm -hmm. and split it up between more people. So everyone gets a smaller piece of the pie. They're only getting 40 hours or this year, maybe up to 40 hours a week. So farms can stay in business because honestly, there are quite a few farms that would not make it if they had that increase in their labor costs. Their margins are just that tight. So essentially, instead of paying these people an additional time and a half of 10 hours, we're just going to bring on other people that we can pay at a regular rate. And then so that's the complaint that some of these farm workers have is like, well, hey, I want to you know, be able to work and not have that money go to someone else, essentially. So my understanding of the bill is it would raise that threshold, like you said, 50 hours uh, for a set 12 weeks a year. Um, I want to play for folks. I played it here coming into the interview, but again, there was some remote testimony and in-person testimony done by farm workers and farm advocates. And there was one in particular. So I don't, first of all, do you know why Senator Saldana was the one translating is that is that normal not to my knowledge she would have been the only probably the only bilingual person on that committee so i can see where that would ha- where she would have stepped into that role but she also has a background as a farm worker union organizer and activist hmm. so she certainly has a vested political interest in this issue as well not the person who should should be advocating or should be translating you know whether they're on one side or the other Mm. those lawmakers need to be listening yeah so i'll play this clip again gracias por su testimonio and again just briefly saying that during the winter it's really hard and there's not enough work there's it's really hard to put the hours together and so that's why when there is work they need the extra hours. Being able to work 50 hours is what allows them to even survive. Um, and it would be even more if they could work those extra 10 hours and have that be time and a half with overtime. And that's my last, my, my comments, because it's really hard for me to translate when I know that they're not given all the information. Thank you. So you hear her there launch into this translation of what the farm worker said, rough, rough translation as we come to find out. Yeah. But then she adds her own little piece at the end saying, well, I'm sure they'd really like the money if that ten, extra 10 hours was time and a half. Uh, talk about the reaction amongst you know the Farm Bureau and the farm community to, to her, uh, the liberties she took with that translation. I think the, the reaction was most immediate from the farm workers who were there and the farm workers who were watching as it happened saying, what? We're trying to testify and share what's happening in our real lives. And you're interjecting yourself to put your thumb on the scale and and put your opinion into someone else's testimony in a way that infers that workers don't know what they're talking about. These folks' lives. That they've been fooled. That they've been fooled. It's their they're not stupid people. They're very smart. They work really hard. They know what's going on with their life and their budget. And yet the same person who claims to champion the underrepresented and minority communities, people of color, is the one who's then essentially suggesting they don't know what they're talking about to the point where she needs to step in and insert her own opinion. I don't know, correct what folks were saying? It it was bizarre. Well, and she says she finds it hard to, to even translate when she feels like they're not being given all the information. Well, that's a pretty good indicator. You probably shouldn't be <laughs> translating for them then. But she also really critically left out, like I said, it, it turns out to be a, have been a very loose uh, translate, almost yeah. a summary of what she said, what he said. Um, and she left out the fact that he said, I support Senate Bill yeah. 5476, which um, yeah. was championed by a Republican. Kind of an important Part of the story kind of a here. Detail. I mean, that's why that person 
Cesar Crescencio, Crescencio, I believe, was the the name of the worker where she decided to insert herself. She had translated a few other workers in similar fashion before without her editorializing. Um, yeah, why why she had to step in there? No, Couldn't help herself. I, clearly, again, like like you noted, she said there. Um, I'm having a hard time translating essentially because of her own political bias on this issue. And the other thing that needs to be pointed out is there was a state certified translator in the room who had helped a different person who wanted to testify in Spanish earlier in the hearing. Mm. Where was that person? That's Why was that question. person not being used? Why did someone with a very specific, strong political bent have to insert themselves when they were supposed to be the one listening and evaluating and actually hearing, maybe having their own opinions challenged. But instead of, and I think that's where all of us should be. You know, if you're in a hearing, you should be listening to people and saying, okay, that's your real lived experience. I'm going to listen to that at, rather than come at you with, you know, where my head is at. The point is maybe there's something I don't understand. Maybe, but instead she was telling them, they didn't understand. I think what's, you, you mentioned lived experience, which the left uses that phrase all the time. And here you have this farm worker who is truly offering their lived experience. Yeah. And then you have the senator that says, oh, no, 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 you don't understand what you're talking about. Let me tell you what your lived experience truly is. It's pretty remarkable. I know that the Washington State Farm Bureau asked for her to apologize. Do you know if she has? I haven't heard anything. Um, and I know, I believe the Senator Square reached out uh, to her office and got no response. That's the most I've heard about it. But very disappointing, again, from someone who claims to champion this community, someone who was, you know, even on this issue, claiming to hold the moral high ground of sh she's the one looking out for folks' best interest. They're there saying what she has done and supported with this law and what she's now ultimately standing against um, is something that's hurting them. You know, it, it, what... what could have happened here is we could have injected a little more common sense into our state's laws. Don't do away, with, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We could still have some overtime, but have something that works and allows people to make more money. Yeah. Well, let's also talk about uh, Senator Kaiser, who's the chair of this committee. She interjected her own little sentiments at the very end, kind of got the mm -hmm. final word on this. Um, and, you know, in so many words, framed the existing laws around farm workers and pay as having roots in racism. Here's what she said. Thank you, Senator King. And I'll just reiterate, in the 1930s, when the Fair Labor Standards Act was passed by Congress, the Southern senators insisted that in order to get that bill done, they had to have an exemption for farm workers. Of course, those were mostly African-American farm workers in the South. But that exemption continued on for 60 years, and we are trying to address that inequity in this state, and I think we are making real progress, and I want to congratulate all of us for the progress we are making. So is that a fair assessment, that some of these laws were born out of, you know, the Deep South, and, and she says mostly black people were, were right. is, it, is, it, is that a fair sentiment? I'm not an expert on that <laughs> history, but from folks that are, they say, no, absolutely not. In fact, at that time, it was like three to one poor white people. This was, we're talking depression era, mm. you know, the folks that were destitute and working hard in the field. This is a totally different era as far as labor standards and things that were going on in society. Well, yeah, we can't compare Washington so, State 2023 to like the slave era in this country, or the but, Great Depression era. But that's what <laughs> Senator Kaiser was doing and saying that's what, She's apparently doing the Lord's work of rooting this systemic racism out when I'm struggling to even see the connection to where we are today. And keep in mind, you know, Senator Kaiser said that. We just talked about what Senator Saldana did inserting herself. Earlier in the hearing, Senator Kaiser also interjected herself and to clarify inferring again that people testifying didn't understand the bill that they were commenting on. I do want to clarify, there's no limit on the number of hours per se. 
just simply that after you work 40 hours, then overtime pay yeah, starts. Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, yeah. because there's no mandate that you yeah. stop working at 40 hours. Yeah, we weren't against paying overtime. We just want a little bit of flexibility so we could provide more hours to the guys. I mean, if I pay 20 hours of overtime to every guy I have, I'm going to go broke. We're going to go out of business. So we just want a little bit of help so we could be able to provide more hours. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because when you employ 400 guys a week and you have to kick in the overtime, Thank you. it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. Which, again, is very disrespectful. There were several hearings in the overall session um, that, you know, the hour before that. No one ever suggested that someone, you know, they were, it was heated testimony back and forth on a few different things having to do with, you know, rules for pot businesses. Mm -hmm. No one ever interjected to su suggest in any way that someone commenting didn't know what they're talking about. But when it came to farm workers who were on a different political spectrum or, you know, who different, spoke a different language, well, like when, as if that makes them dumb. Right. Yeah. And and what else can you assume when, when someone is doing that? But then it should also be mentioned, you talk about this this idea that was inserted at the very end by Senator Kaiser about racism. Keep in mind that Senator Saldana just a, a few years ago introduced a bill in Olympia in an attempt to force farmers to essentially report instances of slavery on their operations. What does that suggest? As if that would ever occur in current day Washington state. It, it's unbelievable. And it was offensive the well, farming community remains offended by that move. And if, as if, if somebody did have slaves that they'd report it to it's, it's, that government. It, it's obvious oh. it was uh, intended to make a statement. Right. It was intended to create waves. And it did. And they were offensive. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, the devil's advocate argument is, hey, this is how society works. We have to have laws in place to protect people, make sure they're paid fair wages. And 40-hour work week seems to be generally yep. accepted. And so... Why would you say that for these farm workers, an extra 10 hours a week, they just have to suck it up and get normal pay? Yeah. My question first is, what are the workers themselves saying? What do they want? And why can't they be the authority on this issue of what, what's best for their lifestyle and for their budget? And, and they are very clearly saying, and this isn't just one you know, handful of people. I travel the state. I've been hearing this now ever since this law was put in place all over. And people are, it, I think they don't even realize how many other people are on the same page as them with the same frustration, but they're saying the same story. They want more hours. They just want to work. They know that's how farming works. The farm owners, the farm managers, supervisors, the laborers across the board during busy seasons, everybody just goes like, that's what I grew up doing. You know, I, during ra red raspberry harvest, when I was a kid, we hardly left the farm during the month of July. Cause that's when we were harvesting our raspberries. My dad made basically all of his income in one month. So every hour was crucial to the future of our family. They know that too. And they also enjoy the benefits of that. You know, I mentioned lifestyle. It's been this way since time immemorial, really, with farming and, you know, make hay when the sun shines. It's busy in certain times, slow in others. Those slow times are beneficial to them as well, particularly Hispanic farm workers who have family elsewhere. And maybe they want to go visit. You know, it was very common for the people that I worked with when I was younger working in farming to take off for a few weeks in December and go back home to Mexico and hang out and catch up with people and come back. For the busy season. Right, yeah, and, and you have to be able to make the hours on the other side of the year to be able to afford to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not a factory situation. It, and really people, you know, they decry factory farming. If you don't want factory farming, don't treat farming like a factory. And to be clear, no one's arguing that Obviously, if they could get time and a half, if the farms could afford to pay them time and a half over 40 hours, obviously the farm workers would prefer that, yeah. right? If they were working 50 hours anyway, they would obviously prefer for those past uh, last 10 hours. But you're saying that the farms, there's many farms that absolutely cannot afford it. Is it possible to, is it even possible to legislate something where by farm size, like a farm of a certain size, you pay overtime over 40 hours a week, a farm 
under that size, you don't have to up until 50 hours? Could that be a compromise? Is that too hard? How, where would you pick the threshold and how, how would well, you, you do Well, you tell me. That? What yeah. is a big farm versus a small farm? I, it doesn't even necessarily, in my view, have to do with size per se, as it does with how the farm is structured. How is it, how is it managed? And I would say with this issue of overtime in particular, you know, it's causing everyone to struggle. But the smaller farms, more than anyone, like we're talking about, larger farms have the systems in place to manage around this. While it's not easy, it may be more doable in one shape or form for a larger farm. At the same time, what's the upshot if a farm can't afford to do it? You know, the idea is, well, somebody's just got to cough up the money. For one, farmers are price takers. Uh, we've heard that probably, if you heard conversations about farming and economics, you probably heard that phrase. It means farmers can't pass something along. If Home Depot has a new mandate put on them that c causes their labor costs to go up, they spread that cost out over what they're selling because they have control of the price for the products that they sell. Farms don't. They have to take what the market will bear. And it's a global market. We're competing not just against other states. We're competing against, you know, farming, food production around the globe. So what happens then if you can't compete, if you can't make it work here in Washington State, that food production goes elsewhere. And that's the scariest thing that's happening with our food system right now. We squabble over these minute details, really in the grand scheme of things, about all these particulars of how farming is done, how farming is regulated here in Washington state, but we're pushing farming right to the brink where if you can't do it here anymore, and it's already happening, yeah. it's leaving. And our food is increasingly being produced in foreign countries where do they pay overtime there? You know, I, fruits like we grow here in Washington state can also be grown in Mexico. We're hearing about people making $11 a day working on farms in Mexico? Yeah. What are the other labor standards? What are the environmental standards? What's the carbon footprint to grow that in a foreign country, then ship it back here to Washington state? And I think everybody would probably agree that they value local food, but they have to realize some of the policies that people are supporting right now is the enemy number one of keeping food local. 2023 is estimated to be the first year where the United States is a net importer of food. Wow. We need to take that seriously. Well, I think you made a good point earlier that right now it's this one-size-fits-all solution when you have an industry that is so, so different and has these really busy peak periods. Um, and, and what I also think is interesting about this, I mean, I think it's a reasonable debate to have. I think that both sides can have some good arguments on, yeah, over 40 hours a week, you got to pay them overtime. It doesn't matter if it's for 12 right. weeks a year. But the issue here is rather than have that conversation about everything that you just laid out and all the things at play, they always want to go back to racism. They always going to want to go back, go back to race and, yep. you know, to telling these farm workers, well, you don't know what you're talking about, yep. rather than have a conversation like this where they really hear them out and look at all the factors that are at play. Um, so it, it's a disappointing way to frame a bill that you don't, you don't like by just saying, well, it's racist. Well, and that, I think that's what was the most troubling to me. Cause again, Hey, are you, are we listening to the people testifying during a hearing? It's not about the lawmakers perspectives on it. They're supposed to be gathering information and yeah. perspective. And I, you know, if, if people disagree, great, let's ha like you said, let's have that debate. And it is a debate that could be had. And, and there are lots of things that go into this. And people may say, well, this whole system is screwed up. And really it is where farmers don't have the ability to pass costs on. But how are you going to change that? And who's going to get hurt in the process? If it's, you know, revolution, we're going to force this down people's throats and, and make things change. Well, who becomes the victim then? Well, it, as it's playing out right now, it's the farm workers. This is a social justice issue of farm workers being hurt. Again, we can have that debate. Let's hash it out. But then to put your thumb on the scale, to um, manipulate, manipulate people's words, suggest they don't know what they're talking about because, I don't know, they're testifying in Spanish. It, it, not healthy whatsoever. Not at all. Uh, Dylan Honkoop, we appreciate the time. Anything else uh, that you think people ought to know about what's happening in our farming communities well i think what we were talking 
about just a moment ago as far as farming leaving Washington State and yeah. leaving the United States is the thing that people need to be paying attention to. It's almost a perfect is the enemy of the good situation here in our food system in our country in Washington State in particular right now. Washington State has some of the most stringent regulations you know, across the board, you name the issue of anywhere in the country and certainly then of just about anywhere in the world. That's great. Okay, you know, we have very safe food. We're protecting the environment. We're getting more sustainable. Can farms get better? Absolutely. And they have been getting better. But if we push that so hard that the upshot is that food production leaves, yeah. we're harming the bigger goal here. And that's what people need to be asking themselves and thinking about. A lot of this stuff is peddled by fear, you know, food fear, because it is so personal. And what am I putting into my body? And it's part of our lifestyle. It's part of our humanity. Food is such a, a, a foundational thing. So people care about it. And it's ve been very easy, like we talked about bougie food trends at the beginning. It's very easy for those to be leveraged by people with an ax to grind or a political game to play or honestly money to be made to um, push this food discussion, whatever it happens to be on a given day, push it around and misinform people about the reality of what's happening with food in our country. So my, my conclusion would be, hey, any of these issues, be asking questions. Ask what's really going on. Not that you have to take the farmer's word um, as gospel, you know, ask them the hard questions too. Again, farming can always get better. But think about what the real big picture impact is of what we're doing. I love it. Very well said. And we don't want our government regulating our way out of a reliable local food supply. That's the opposite of the direction we should be going. Dylan, thanks so much. Make one more plug for your podcast. It's the Real Food, Real People podcast. You can find it on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all the socials, and... Um, and on your podcast platforms as well, Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all of those. Mm -hmm.